So thank you for the invitation. As Rachel's already indicated, I want to suggest to you that reproductive biology, so what we all do, is about a lot more than just making babies. And that perhaps as a field we have an image problem and it's about time we did something about it. I also need to uh, give you a few, a few disclaimers about what I think and where my thinking is coming from. And the first is that I am a huge fan of assisted reproductive biology technologies. It has improved the lives of thousands of Australians and in the development of ART and all that has flowed from it, we've discovered a huge amount about um, human reproduction and that has flowed onto many areas. I also think it's a fantastic example of research translation. I also happen to think it's not just about treating the individuals. As a broad field, our work impacts upon the health of most Australians and it has a huge impact on the Australian economy. I also think that infertility is a disease and people who are infertile have the same rights to treatment as others who, for example, who might have developmental disorders or cancers. And unlike most other areas of medical treatment, we actually produce taxpayers. <laughs> so for a relatively small investment at the start of somebody's life, I believe they pay back that investment many, many, many fold. I also fully accept that issues around uh, fertility are intricately and complexly entwined with social, with social and cultural issues and that to get reproductive biology research onto a level playing field with something like cancer will take many decades, but I think we should aim for it. It's going to have to be a whole of, co a whole of society approach, but really as members of the Society of Reproductive Biology, we probably need to be leading that discussion. And my last point is I need to apologise that if I don't mention your particular sub-discipline of reproductive biology. Reproductive biology is an enormously broad area and there is massive depth within Australia. <laughs> so my message for today is that, well, the job's not done. There's enormous amounts more to do if we hope to get the best out of uh, the Australian economy and Australian health. It's also not a luxury research that is aimed at treating rich people. It's about the health of, as I think, the majority of Australians. And as I want to illustrate to you today, it has implications far beyond just making sperm and eggs and babies. These comments have all been said to me by the public, by professors, by grant reviewing, by people who've reviewed my grants. And comments like, there are too many people in the world anyway, so why most money on fertility research is at best just plain wrong. So I think we should stop being silent about our research. We need to explain to the public what we're about and who we're happen helping. We need to stand up for our constituencies so ultimately they can stand up for us. So there are three specific points I want you to take home. The first is that often fertility is the canary in the coal mine of human health. The second is that reproductive biology has often been and will continue to be the lifting off point for other areas of, for areas of research that are of general relevance to somatic cells and health broadly. And third is that when it comes to making healthy babies, any old sperm and any old egg is not good enough. We should be aiming for quality and there's a lot more that could be done. So the first thing I wanted to ask, well, is infertility the harbinger of early death? And in the male area, there's actually quite good data on this, but I just want to highlight two studies. And the first one is from uh, Copenhagen, and this is a study of some 43,000 men who had presented at infertility clinics, and this was either for their own infertility or the infertility of their partner. And I like it for two reasons. One is the large number, so I think they have numbers on their side, and the second is by concentrating on men who are presenting for infertility treatment, you are removing a lot of the socioeconomic variables that could have implications on uh, life expectancy. And what they found was, fa it was fascinating. The first is that sperm concentration is positively correlated with life expectancy. The more sperm you have in your ejaculate, the longer you are likely to live. That's up to a ceiling of about 40 million per mil. Similarly, the higher the percentage of positive sperm, of uh, normal morphology sperm you have in your ejaculate, the longer you're likely to live. Good-looking sperm, likely to live longer. 
They also showed that this increased life expectancy was not due to the presence of children in the house. So men who had poor quality sperm but lived in a household with their partner's children, for example, were still likely to die at a younger age than men who had good quality sperm who lived in a house with their partner's children. This study was largely supported by another one that came out this year. This time uh, it was about 12,000 men and they were looking at patients in California and Texas. But they cut their data a slightly different way. What they found was that if men presented with any two of a decreased sperm count, poor sperm morphology or decreased semen volume, they had a 2.3-fold increased risk of dying in the next eight years compared to men who had normal semen profiles or only one of those factors. They claimed they had a 90% predictive value on this. And what was shocking about this, and it amazes me that it wasn't picked up by more uh, newspapers, that this is virtually the same risk of death as men who smoked or had diabetes. So maybe you do die of infertility. So why are these infertile men uh, dying younger? Well, the simple answer is we don't know. It's probably from uh, any one of a thousand different reasons. It raises the question of, uh, did these men have uh, pre-existing somatic diseases and as a result their infertility was secondary infertility? Or was spermatogenesis the canary in the coal mine? Did they have primary infertility and that was caused by a defect in a pathway of critical importance to sperm production but of creeping long-term importance to a critical cellular process that eventually killed them? We know some of the answers. We know that there's a small group of diseases like cystic fibrosis that we know will critically impair male infertility, but it will also significantly decrease um, life expectancy. But I would have expected that they, in, in, the ca in cases like this, the men would have been pre-diagnosed and it certainly would have accounted for the statistical association. There are studies out there showing that infertile men have an increased risk of cancer, and I think it's fair to say it's solid data to say they have an increased risk of testicular cancer, which makes perfect sense. If you've got a mass in your testis, you're unlikely to produce as many sperm. But I've also included another one on high-grade prostate cancers. And again, from a biochemical perspective, this makes perfect sense. We know that DNA repair pathways are absolutely critical to produce normal sperm numbers and normal sperm quality. And they're the same pathways that are required to prevent cancers. So there's a logical link there, but I think it's true to say the clinical data is not as solid as I would like to see it. We also know there's a very convincing link between androgen levels and overall health, and in particular cardiovascular disease and metabolic health. And a lot of this data is coming out of Australia. There's also data from people like Mark Hedger who are showing that uh, there's a very strong link between inflammatory diseases and um, infertility, and that a lot of the inflammatory processes are normal regulatory processes for spermatogenesis, so there's um, a link there. In reality, most of these cases are going to be caused by a complex interaction between the man's or woman's genetics, epigenetics, and the environment they're exposed to. But it raises a very interesting question. So as we as a community learn more about these associations, when a man presents for infertility treatment, should we be doing whole genome sequencing or whole epigenome profiling as a means to predict, predict future deadly disease? Either way, we're currently not making the most of the opportunity of a man presenting for infertility treatment. If we can see these associations already, perhaps we should be giving the couple, and the man in particular, a full workover to see whether we can start to see subclinical signs of future more deadly diseases that could be treated earlier, and at the same time given the kids that they want. So if you accept that premise, we as a community have to provide that baseline data. So I then wanted to know, was female fertility, uh, infertility associated with early death? And I've got to tell you, I spent far too long wasting my time looking around the internet on this, and I didn't find the answer, but there's a lot of rubbish out there about female fertility. So I'm hoping someone in the audience can tell me. So the next part of the talk, I want to concentrate on a few areas that I've called born from reproductive biology, and I'm just mentioning a few of many. 
The first one is contraception, arguably the most important. And it's important because it has fundamentally changed the lives of women. It's gone a long way to contributing to closing the gender gap. It's massively increased workforce participation with enormous economic benefits. But we shouldn't assume that the job is done for reasons of either cost, symptoms, availability or cultural reasons. There's a very significant proportion of the world's population who find current methods unacceptable. Uh, I point you towards the, this review that's uh, very interesting and there's a matching male version. The second is stem cells and you've heard a little bit about it this morning but I'm just going to give one example. And I chose this example because I think it's a perfect illustration of what's wrong with our field. This pelvic prolapse is a, an extraordinarily big and important problem but it's a bit ooky. And so we don't talk about it, and no one, you know, no one knows about it, and it doesn't get nearly enough as much funding as I would like to see it. Of course, it happens because of childbirth, its incidence increases with age and with obesity, for example, but it affects 25% of all women, 50% of women over the age of 50 who've had children. The treatment is a very invasive surgery that up until recently required the implantation of stiff, meshes that would help support the prolapse. The problem was there were huge numbers of complications, uh, lots of surgery had to be repeated and very recently the meshes had been withdrawn from the market. So I just want to highlight the work of one Australian lab and this is Caroline Gargett's work from uh, the Ritchie Centre out at Monash. So what she and her team are doing is that they are harvesting mesenchymal stem cells from the endometriosum, endometrium they're expanding them. They're now at the stage of testing them using other rat models that they, they see them on these flexible meshes that should be able to move with the women, uh, decreasing pain and inflammation. They're testing them using rat and sheep models towards the ultimate goal of implanting them into women. And I reckon this is the sort of stuff we should be telling the world about, that funding agencies should be shouting from the rooftops about the good work that we're doing but we don't hear much about it. Just quickly want to jump on these two. So um, in, in method processes to uh, safeguard endangered species and agricultural donor insemination grew, grew directly from the ART programs. And the latter has probably brought billions of dollars into the Australian market. I also want to concentrate on epigenetics. You had a lovely session this afternoon where as many of you will know, spermatogenesis is the hotbed of epigenetic regulation. If you interfere with any of DNA methylation, small RNA content, or, hit, or the histone code, you get male sterility. But if you just tinker with it a little bit, fertility is allowed, but it affects the, the offspring health. A couple of examples. Oh, I'll just premise that by saying I think it's going to be equally important in the female reproductive tract as well, but it hasn't been studied nearly as well. And dare I say, the reason for that is uh, these mouse models where a lot of these things start are usually made by molecular biologists that really, unless the phenotype hits them on the head, they think it's not there. So now as reproductive biologists are getting hold of these models, they're realising that there are serious problems with these eggs and it has serious implications for their offspring. And it's probably going to be the same uh, for humans. If you need a quick catch-up, I point you towards this lovely review that was published by uh, Michelle Lane, Becky Robker and Sarah Robson last week in, in Science. And just a couple of examples. So we know, for example, um, using if you overfeed rats in this case, or potentially humans, that this will have long-term implications for their offspring. And this area of research was really catalyzed by Margaret Morris in Sydney. Similarly, if you underfeed animals, probably also humans, it will also have epigenetic consequences for the, of their offspring. And there's also indications that this is also likely to be the case in humans. This is perhaps not the best example to include, but I include it just to raise important questions of. These epigenetic perturbations, are they due to starting off with suboptimal gametes or is it a technique problem? Just a little bit about the small non-coding RNA. So these are the pi RNAs and the micro RNAs. And I want to point you to this beautiful study that comes from the area of neuroscience. 
What they found was that they used a pup separation model where pups, mice were born and then they separated them from their mothers for a very short period of time. This is very, very stressful. This is very stressful. The, the pups hate it. They transfer them back quite quickly and then they grow up in a nice cushy animal house. Those pups, those male pups then grow up to have decreased avoidance behaviour. Their offspring had perturbed metabolic profiling. They had increased metabolism and, and um, abnormal insulin signalling. That lab, that lab then went on to show that if you purify the small RNAs from the F1 father's sperm and you injected them into the oocyte at the same time as you fertilise it with a normal male sperm, that you got the same phenotype. So that change in brain behaviour was due to the small RNAs that were contained within the sperm. Also, it's just not what's in the sperm. It's what the sperm is surrounded by, as well as the environment that they're incubated in. This is work from Sarah Robinson, again, showing that um, there's a complex dialogue between the seminal plasma and the maternal reproductive tract. And if you interfere with this, it not only affects contraception, but it affects the health of the offspring. And lastly, something that's very close to my heart is cilia biology. In 1976, Bjorn Avzilis identified, reported that the drive shaft of the sperm cell was this structure here called the axoneme. Very quickly later, oh, it's gone a bit weird, that's a, New England Journal of, um, that's a New England Journal of Medicine paper where he and a couple of others reported that the causes of human primary cilia dyskinesia was actually defects in this structure. And these two papers directly seeded an entire field of medicine called, uh, called uh, ciliopathies that have been discovered over the last 40 years. And if you pick up a science or a nature paper, there'll be a new one of these every month. That just leaves me to say, be loud about your science, explain to the public what you're doing and why it matters, and to say thank you.